We're praying that healing will take place in marriages, in families. So today as you set us free, Lord, we're looking forward to the path that you're paving for us futuristically, individually, for our families, for our church. So Lord, as you touch every single heart, we can believe that with lifted hands. I'm praying that you would shower every person in here not only your presence, your hand, your favor, that you would shine your face on every life. Every person here will receive it in the name of Jesus to receive the favor of God, to receive the favor of God. Receive it. And I know it's not much. I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing hallelujah. Hallelujah. I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, I'm nothing else fit for a king, except for a heart singing pray that you would speak into our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, amen. So happy that you guys are here with us. I don't know if you know, but today, um, it's the start of Holy Week. This is the day, Palm Sunday, thousands of years ago over 2,000 years ago, where Jesus, he came right into Jerusalem on a coat. And this was the day that we're going to march all the way down. We're going to count down where he would be crucified Friday and he would resurrect Sunday. And they call this Holy Week from this Sunday till Easter. And so today we're celebrating just like every other Sunday, but we're celebrating today the start of Holy Week. So as you uh, reflect back on your life and where you would be if it wasn't for Jesus taking that march to the cross, starting today when he rode on a coat and everyone threw palm branches down and they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. And so we're in, this, in the middle of a series 
entitled His Story Plus Your Story. And the reason why we entitled that is because we believe that when Jesus' story intersects with your story, my story, our story, transformation takes place. Like lives are never the same after your life intersect with Jesus. And so because of that, we wanted to take a look throughout the Bible. When others came in contact with Jesus and what happened? What did it look like? How did they, their life look? And then what did they actually do to come in contact with Jesus? Because we know that it's by faith that you accept Jesus, but faith without works is dead. So they done something, and we've looked through a few stories. Today we're going to look at a portion of the Bible in Matthew chapter 4. And I entitle this, The Battle is Real. And the reason why is because in Matthew chapter 4, what happens is Jesus is tempted by Satan. I don't know if you remember that. He fasts 40 days. He's tempted by Satan. But what I want you to know about temptation is temptation is not sin. It's actually the moment when you haven't sinned yet, but you want to. And you actually feel like you need to in order to accomplish what needs to be done. Temptation is just an invite. It's an invitation to sin. Now, just like someone giving you an invite to a party, you're not at the party yet. They just invited you to the party. And you have a choice whether you go to the party or you don't. That's what temptation is like. Temptation is an invite to sin. And we face temptation every single day. And the temptation is to do what is forbidding by God. And which is going to harm our relationship with God. And there's various temptations. There's so many different. There's a variety of temptations. You know, it's a fight for our affection. And many times they overwhelm our faculties, forcing us to choose them over what's right. Our, our sinful minds, our sinful natures direct us into taking delight and satisfaction in surrendering to these temptations, these sinful temptations. Now, Jesus was actually led to the wilderness by the Spirit. This is often a contradictive statement for some. But what I would like to pose and present to you today, you know how in the scripture it says, lead me not into temptation? Have you, have you ever read that in, in the scriptures? It's actually a prayer by Jesus. He says, this is how we should pray. Now, when it was translated, it says, lead us not into temptation in the English version. But what it's saying is, lead me not into sin. That's why it says, forgive me of my trespass. Trespass means you already sinned. That's why it shifts to that. Lead me not into my trespasses. You know, I mean, you know, lead me not into sin is the real translation. He says, forgive me of my trespass. In context, it's letting you know it's talking about you've already sinned. So he said, lead me not into sin. So when you see that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, and we know later he was tempted, this is not contradictory to what God is saying in the verse when he says, lead me me not into temptation. Are y'all getting this or no? Yeah. Okay, so what he's saying is the spirit led him into the, to the wilderness. 
Now, the wilderness is a place where you're wandering and you're wandering. The wilderness always is a place where you're wandering and you're wondering. We've all been in wildernesses in our life, right? Where you're wondering and you're wandering. You're, you're wandering around. Seems like you keep on going in circles. Remember the children of Israel? The children of Israelites, they were, they were wandering in the where? Wilderness. Because, they, and they were wondering, why did God ever bring us to this place? And that's what a wilderness always represents. A wilderness represents where you're wandering and you're wondering. Well, we know that the, our king, Jesus, he's here. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So there was a reason why he's going to the wilderness. He's going to be tempted. It says then. Now, this word then is a transitional word. You, you got to note that. That when, when it says then in verse 1, it's very important. It doesn't just mean, and then this happened. It means that what is happening in chapter 4 is in conjunction with what happened in chapter 3. Okay, so chapter 3 Jesus was baptized, and when he was baptized, he came out of the water, and the voice of God came from heaven and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So he speaks over the life of Jesus. I'm telling you, as soon as you, God, speak a word over your life so many times, the temptations are coming right next. The test is coming later. I mean, if you came out of church and you felt so good, and as soon as you get in the car, it's like you don't even get in the car yet, and you're arguing with your wife, you're arguing with your husband, your kiddo's getting just real demonic all of a sudden. Or should I say they're getting very curious? And so he gets this word spoken over his life. This is my son in, in whom I'm well pleased. I'm pleased with Jesus, he's baptized. He comes up out of the water. It says that the Holy Spirit comes up on him like a dove. Everyone witnesses this immediately. See, you got to understand the devil did not really know who Jesus was until those words were spoken. The devil doesn't know everything. Don't ever think that the devil knows everything. God knows everything. The devil doesn't. And so it was never spoken now, remember when there was a time where Jesus, uh, when, when Jesus was born, the devil was using someone to kill all the babies because they didn't know who he was. No one knew. Soon as the words were spoken, then the spirit drove him or led him into the wilderness. And there the devil began to tempt him. This is how Satan works. As soon as you have a spiritual high, often is followed by a spiritual low. I'm telling you, you'll be tempted exactly as Jesus was. Because Jesus was being tempted as we are. And so Jesus is tempted by Satan. Now you got to get this. Satan has a bag full of old tricks. He has a bag full of old tricks, the devil does. He's not using any other new, he's not using new methods. It's the same old lies. Satan always wants to put a question mark in your life where God has put periods. He wants you to question what God has said. And once God said it, it's over, it's final, that's it. It's done. And so let's remember, God said, the Father from the heaven, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Chapter 3. Chapter 4, 
Let's look at the first temptation. Number one, he's tempting him to turn stone to bread. In verse 2 through 4, it says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Talking about Jesus, obviously. After 40 days, 40 nights, this guy's hungry. And I love this. Jesus, seeing the humanity of, of God. Seeing the humanity of Jesus. I love it. Because that means he can understand me. He gets me. He knows when I'm going through temptation. He knows when I'm going through my own issues. He can understand me, but then we know he's full, fully God. So not only can he understand me, he can rescue me because he's God. So he's hungry. I, don't, I, don't wanna, I just want to point that out. He's hungry. In verse 3, the tempter, talking about Satan, came to him and said, if you are the son of God, Remember, God the Father has already spoken over his life and said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, he's wanting him to question his identity. He's wanting to question the word that God already spoke over his life. If you are, remember, he always wants to put a question mark where God has already put a period. He's saying, if you are, and that's many times what happens with us. If you are a woman of God, because he wants you to question whether you're a child of God or a man of God, or, you know, he wants to challenge you. He says, so if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, it's no secret. Jesus is going to answer with the word of God. But I want you to see that he's standing on what God said instead of what this man is having him question, or this enemy, the devil, is having him question. Jesus answered, it is written. Man shall not eat off of bread alone. He's not talking about a meal. He's not, he's not thinking about a meal. He's not thinking fleshly. He says, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, he says, I've already gotten a word from God. He said that I am his son in whom he's pleased. He's going back to that. He's going back to saying, I'm standing on what God said about me, not on how I feel about myself. Now, I feel like I'm hungry. He feels like he's hungry, but he says, I'm, I'm not going to eat. And sometimes you may feel depressed. You may feel less than. You may feel, feel like a failure. But the reality is you got to hang on what God words say about you. I am a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I'm the head, not the tail. I am a child of God. I am forgiven. Sometimes you may feel like you have just ran out the grace of God and God just won't forgive you again. Guess what? You got to go back to what God's words say. He says, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Somebody say, I am a child of God. And in his in this first temptation, in this first temptation, Satan leads Jesus on this trip. If you are the son of God, then, meaning you're not the child of God. You're not the son of God if you don't do this. And see, you got to realize that works is not connected to your identity. See, who comes before the do. You, you do because of who. You, you, you don't do so you can be who. You don't do something so you can be a child of God. You do it because you are a child of God. This is how the enemy works. He's trying to get him to question what God has said about him. The second temptation, he says, throw yourself off. In verse 5, it says, then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And here it is again, question his identity, verse 6. If you are, temptation is always really challenging because it's questioning who you are as a person. 
It's questioning your identity in Christ. It's questioning who you are. Throw yourself down. This is what Satan says. For it is written. Now he says, well, since you know scripture, Jesus, let me bring out some scripture myself. And this is the dangerous thing about the enemy. I know I've been on my knees before. Complex prayer. Confused. Having all this lack of clarity going on inside of me. And I'm praying and I'm telling you, my flesh, the enemy, demons, everything else be throwing scripture at me and everything to try to confirm to do something that's outside of God's will. And if you don't watch out, and if you don't know the voice of God, if you don't have a word, a prior word that you hold on to. See, he already knew that God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And so because he's hanging on to this, he does not have to do anything to prove himself or prove to this devil or prove to anyone else who he is. So here it is. He says, for it is written. Now he's about to quote scripture to the devil. He will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus comes back. And he claims his identity in the fullness right now. Jesus answered him and said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. He says, I'm not going to test my father, and I don't know why you're even trying to test me, because I am God. And so here it is. This is very important for us to see, because if Satan tempted Jesus, who are we? The battle is real. And so Satan takes Jesus from this isolated desert to the populated city of Jerusalem, and he shows him this, this city, this nation. He says, look, I'll give you all this. And so Satan tempts Jesus to throw himself off, <laughs> and he misuses scripture. This is a reminder that Satan, he knows scripture, and he'll twist it and distort it. But Jesus already knew everything's mine already. Why would I have to do something in order to gain it? I'm here to tell you, you don't need to do anything to gain God's approval. All you have to do is keep your faith in Jesus Christ. Because that's where the approval is at, is in Christ. The third temptation, he says, bow down and worship. Now, verse 8 because in this temptation, he's saying, bow down and worship. And so again, the devil, he took him to a very high place, took him to a mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the splendor. And look what he says, all this I'll give you. He said, if you bow down and worship me. Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, closes up, he says, Away from me, Satan. He's like, I'm through with this. I'm tired of this. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This is very important for us to get because Satan takes Jesus to a very high mountain. This mountain was most likely a mountain in the border of Israel where other surrounding kingdoms could be seen. And so he takes him up there, and when this text says that Satan shows Jesus all of this in order for him to bait him in so he could worship Satan. And so Satan offers Jesus these things. But this is what happens. The devil leaves. And as soon as those temptations leave, it says that Jesus nourished. Verse 11 says, and the devil left him, and behold, 
angels came and ministered to him. I'm going to tell you right now that sometimes when you're going through temptation, oh, I went through temptation and feel like scud missiles and, and bullets was just flying into my mind and into my heart. All kind of crazy stuff going on. Nowadays, they label it different things. I'm a big component of mental health. I'm true, truly a, a man that believes that anxiety exists, but sometimes we label things and we don't know that we're really under attack and we're being tempted. We just don't know how to label it no more. Oh, girl, my anxiety. And I'm not saying that anxiety does not exist. I get anxious sometimes. And I do understand mental health. I go to a therapist myself. So I believe in all those things. But the reality is we got to be able to identify when this is really just a temptation from the enemy so we can approach it right. Because when we don't approach it right, we can't get victory when we're not approaching it right. We're trying to, we're trying to heal it from a, from a therapeutic standpoint, and it's really a spiritual situation. You know, we're trying to heal it from the wrong view. And so overcoming sin through the gospel is accomplished through a few things. I want to tell you this. I want you to get this. We do not run from temptation without running to God. You cannot run from temptation in, if you don't run to God first. You cannot get out of that temptation because you have to run to God. You'll be running forever. And everywhere you go, you're taking the temptation with you because the temptation is within. And so we do not run from temptation without running to God. Because with the gospel, because of the gospel and with the gospel, we can overcome the temptations from Satan. We can. We can. I know when, when it starts hitting your brain, sometimes you feel like, oh, my God, I don't know how I'm going to overcome this. You feel like laying in the bed. The covers feel like they're 1,000 pounds. You don't want to answer your phone. You don't want to answer any emails. You begin to start wondering, you know, what? am I sane? Am I insane? What is wrong with me? Because temptations will begin to come into your mind. I know I'm not alone in this. That we have these battles. The battle is real. And you overcome sin through the gospel. And it's accomplished by this. I'm going to give you three things as I close this up. I'm going to give you three take-homes. This, this, this is how I want you to feel. I want you to feel like you're not alone. Okay? I want you to feel that. I, I want you to get that. You're not alone. I, I need you to get that. You're not the only one. You're not the only one battling. I need you to get that in your heart. No, I want to take out some time and just really lean in here. If Jesus was tempted, who are we? If the devil said, I'm going to tempt God in the flesh. Who are we? We're human beings. Fallible. Flawed. So if he would, if Satan would tempt, if he'll tempt Jesus, oh, you, you best believe he's going to tempt us. The battle is real. So I want you to feel like this. I'm not alone. I have a God that understands me, and I have a God that actually overcame already. And he lives inside of me. And so once you accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, Jesus comes to live inside of you. And when he comes to live inside of you, now you can overcome the temptation just like he overcame. First thing I want you to get, reestablish faith in God's care for you. That you no longer have to seek life for yourself apart from God. See, what was happening was Satan was asking Jesus to seek identity outside of God's word. He was asking him through attempting him to get a stone and turn it into bread. And Jesus said, no. Man doesn't live off bread alone. But he was attaching that to his identity. He said, if you are the son of God. See, it is so many times in 
our minds, we say, man, if I am Christian, why am I feeling this way? If I am a Christian, why am I thinking like this? If I am a Christian, why aren't I blessed the way I see everyone else blessed? And you begin to start attaching external behaviors, or you will begin to attach things that you have or don't have to your identity. You'll think, this is who I am. This is who I'm not. And we have to reestablish faith in God and say, you know what? I am a child of God. God cares for me. And so I don't have to seek out an identity outside of God. Sometimes people are seeking out identity through relationships. Just can't be alone for nothing. Just, you would rather be in hurt and hate and an unhealthy situation than to just say, you know what? The reality is I am a child of God if I'm single, if I'm married, if I'm not, if I don't have someone, if I'm not dating, I am a child of God. I'm a child of God if I have children, if I don't have children, if I preach, if I don't preach, if I own my house, if I'm renting, if I, I'm leasing or I'm buying my car, if, if I'm Ubering, if I'm riding a lift. Guess what? I am a child of God no matter what. No matter what. And we got to understand that we have to reestablish our faith in God. That you care for me. And then we have to reestablish our faith in God's sufficiency for you. That you no longer have to provide for yourself apart from God. You, you really don't want anything that God doesn't have for you. I have to pray that to me myself. I, I, myself, I have to pray that, this to God. I have to ask God. Myself, I have to ask the Lord. Please, Lord, help me not to pursue anything that you don't have for me. Help me, God, because I know I'm a hustler. I'm a moving a shaker now. I'll make some stuff happen and call it God. I want to make sure that what you have for me, that it's God providing that, that you brought that to us. I don't want to have to make it happen and then try to say, oh, I'm just blessed. Oh, you know how good God is. I want to make sure that it's you providing it. So sometimes you have to reestablish that. See, what was happening was Satan was trying to provide for God. He was trying to provide for Jesus. He was trying to say, hey, well, you know what? Uh, if you can turn this stone into, into bread, as a matter of fact, um, if you will actually, um, you know, bow down to worship me, I'll give you this. He's like, no, 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 God provides for me. God provides for me. I don't, I don't have to compromise at all. I'm not going to lie on my resume. I'm not going to lie at the interview. I'm not going to write up, write up some type of, uh, you know, paperwork just to make sure that I can get it. Let's make sure that God is providing for us. Can we do that, church? We want to make sure that God is our sole provider. We have to reestablish our faith in God, that God, you got the ability. You are sufficient. You can provide a spouse for me. And all the single folks should have said, you can provide a spouse for me. You can provide a house for me. You can provide that small business, that, that startup business for me. You can provide. You can, God. You are sufficient. And I believe that you can do that. So going back to number two, reestablish faith in God's sufficiency. And then as we close up, understand that you deserve nothing less or more than the grace God has given you. You deserve nothing less or more. God's grace is enough. You know, I love this scripture that the Apostle Paul says this, and I just make it my hand. I've owned that thing. He said, it's because the grace of God, I am who I am. 
And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus said, God's grace is enough for me. He spoke over my life. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And I'm telling you, you have a word over your life right here. If you get in God's word, God has spoken a word over your life. And you need to claim it and own it. Every time something comes your way to challenge you, to believe you're not who God says you are, you need to go back to what God's word say about you and own it, claim it, believe it, embrace it. Because I am who I am because of the grace of God. Come on, everyone lift up their voice.